So, again, uh, everyone, welcome to the uh, workshop. Uh, we're planning on having a lot of fun and interesting discussion. Uh, and the goal of today's session is to get some of that set up. Uh, and in particular talk about some of the questions and ideas we want to focus on uh, and talk about some of the structure, for example, working groups uh, that we might uh, put together to be part of that. As background for that, I wanted to start out with the basic schedule of the workshop uh, week by week, at least the exceptional weeks are listed here. And so there are focus weeks uh, and emphasis weeks in a fairly obvious notation. The difference is uh, that emphasis weeks are, well, they're basically uh, what they say. There will be some emphasis on that subject, uh, but that's about it. Uh, the focus weeks, we will be bringing in extra people as speakers, and we will have extra activity during the focus weeks. So that's the critical difference. So for example, next week, uh, there will be even more activity than uh, the typical week, uh, well, we have this focus week on decoding the hologram. Uh, and then, of course, one other exceptional week is the Entanglement Conference, uh, and so you should bear that in mind, and we'll have a lighter uh, schedule in our own workshop that week. So that's some background, which I think is important to, well, so people understand uh, you know, what already is planned and some of the rhythm of that. Uh, but we should really talk about what other questions we want to focus on uh, besides this set or within this set, uh, and what other activities and structure to add. Uh, as I mentioned, working groups uh, you know, is one sort of important uh, piece of structure that it could be quite useful. I, I wanted to also suggest that we bear in mind, uh, well, first of all, well, the title of the session today, uh, I titled it uh, Facets of the Problem of Quantum Gravity, uh, because I think we should keep in mind that, you know, really quantum gravity is one problem uh, and, you know, may well have a unique solution. But, of course, in trying to find that, we've uh, found ourselves exploring many facets and approaches uh, to the problem, and you know, that's why part of why the field is so broad. There, there are all these uh, sort of different approaches and takes on it. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> since we are talking about one problem, there are a lot of connections. And for example, I've illustrated a couple of the connections uh, sort of between focus weeks, but really there are more than I've uh, written there. Uh, and another thing I wanted to uh, suggest that you bear in mind when we discuss what we're doing is that we may want some earlier focused activity on some of these subjects. For example, black hole information comes at the very end of the workshop, and it's been a pretty hot topic, uh, I guess pun intended, perhaps. Uh, and so that's something where we may well want to have some, say, a working group or, or some other form of more organized discussion before the focus week at the very end, because a lot of people are interested in that. Uh, so that's just something to, to keep in mind as we organize things here. Uh, so what I've done is uh, put up some suggested areas, broad areas, uh, that we could uh, consider. Uh, and I've put just a sprinkling of a few questions uh, that might uh, sort of serve as examples of the kinds of questions we might uh, ask and address. Uh, and of course, I'm looking forward to everyone here generating a lot more. Uh, and so the plan is, uh, beginning with this, for actually uh, Ted to lead a discussion of what else to consider and hopefully it, well, at least in the past when this has been done, we end up with a pretty full board. So you know, everyone is encouraged to put out their suggestions, uh, ideas, et cetera, what, what really they think is important. Uh, and we'll try to sort of 
get some important guidance from that about uh, how to uh, have a very interactive and lively workshop. So uh, that's about all I have to say. I guess one other thing is to please bear in mind that uh, also Tom Banks will be giving a talk tomorrow. And uh, as another possible activity, he has volunteered to give a set of lectures following up uh, his sort of initial lecture tomorrow. Uh, on the topic of holographic space-time. So that could be another uh, activity that's sort of at the level of a working group uh, for whoever is interested. So that's something else to think about. So unless there are other quest or questions. Uh, Before we start this, do you want yeah. to say something about the typical week? Um, oh, the yeah. I, well, the typical week will be similar to this week. <laughs> Let me go over that. You mean just the schedule? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have. Uh, an introductory meeting scheduled Mondays at 2. And I think often we will have you know, not just introductions to each other, but uh, we'll have some activity like a discussion or maybe a talk. Then Tuesdays at 12.30, we'll have a talk nominally. Uh, Wednesdays at 11. Uh, Thursdays at 2. Uh, and then Fridays. I think we'll probably stick with 11. There's been some back and forth. We may have to shift that, but I think we'll, at least for now, we have a Friday slot at 11. Uh, and we anticipate a mix of uh, formal talks and discussions. For example, this week we have uh, planned a discussion on uh, observables for Friday morning. Uh, we have some ideas about who to, uh, well, who might contribute to that discussion, but if that's something you're particularly interested in contributing to, please let me know after the session today uh, as well, so we can sort of organize that a little bit more. So. Right. I mean, some of it will be just spontaneous, but it right. means if you want to prepare to present something. Yeah, five or 10 minutes or something like that. Yeah. So. Other things at all? Yeah, sure. I'd like to just mention another possible activity, which is every Wednesday at 4, a group of us will be riding our bikes up the local mountain. <laughs> and Wednesday at 4, okay. In addition of bringing new people into this activity, last spring program we had maybe 10 people who had <clears> never <throat> done it before. Many imagined they couldn't do it, and they were all successful. So if you're interested in... Is that Old San Marcos? Old San Marcos. So 1,200 yeah. feet. It's a 10-mile round trip from here. Yeah, generalizing that comment, uh, and we put this on the, <laughs> put this on the wiki. You know, well, many of you know Santa Barbara pretty well. Uh, for those who don't, there are a lot of possible outdoor activities here that uh, can be, you know, nice social activities as well. Going for a hike, going for a bike ride, various other things. And uh, we've at least started a space on the wiki where people can put down their names if they're interested in various of these things, and we can maybe coordinate some or. You know, if it's an activity where only a few people are interested, you can coordinate with each other. So that's you know, something we would strongly urge people do, to do, including you know, if the Vikings should go on there uh, and other things. So. OK, any other comments? So, so presumably once the entanglement program starts, this, you'll stick to this. It's, it's going to be there's no thought of to. cutting back or? or well. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> so, you know, it's obviously going to be in, well, a lively time, right? Because uh, there will be a lot of common interest. And uh, we'll just have to see how it goes, I think, and play it by ear. And we'll how see. Many, how, how many talks are there at the conference every day? At the work, the, the entangled conference. Oh, that'll be, you know, a full standard KITP conference. So it's basically a full schedule for the we week. Four Today or More than that, I would yeah. guess. I, I don't know the details of the schedule, but the usual thing is basically all day long, except you know, one day or something, or it's a half day. So, yeah, I think that week will. Uh, to imagine us doing anything else if we actually want to attend. Yeah, we'll want to keep it rather light. So that's why yeah. it's on the radar for that reason, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, anything else? Or Ted starts us off brainstorming. No other comments, questions, concerns? Okay, well, I'm going to sit down and eat the rest of my lunch and get <laughs> Ted going. My role is really just to write on the board what you say. To 
channel the collective will. But I guess a nice place to start would be with um, observable, since we're planning a discussion on that. Um, will this pick up the audience discussion? Uh, you know, it usually does some. It's not perfect. algebraic approach to, say, quantum field theory, where we associate algebras with regions. And that's important because when we're talking about, uh, say, entanglement or other issues like that, uh, we need some notion of subsystems whose degrees of freedom we're entangling. And so a nice way of sort of defining that structure is not actually from tensor factors of the Hilbert space, because that's problematic for various reasons in field theory and in gauge theory in particular. Uh, but we can get at that structure uh, you know, from, the, uh, from the algebra of observables and the subalgebras that are, again, associated with subregions. In local quantum field theory, that's how it works. Now, gravity, right. it's pretty clear, is different. And so the big question is, uh, you know, what structure do we have there uh, that, in a sense, maybe guides us to a generalization of the kind of structure we have in local quantum field theory? That's sort of a okay. few-sentence summary. Um, I'll add something just to <coughs> maybe get somebody to complain. Okay, what about... Closed universes. So great uh, advance in quantum gravity has been through ADS-CFT. We have a, a whole collection of things we think are observables, actually, the theory, because we identify them in an ordinary quantum field theory. What do we do if there's no uh, boundary? So there's is this there doesn't no refer back to observables, right? But, or this is under the category. Of yes. This. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know how to put this in exactly into a slogan, but something that I think is, is really important in this context is the, the question of um, locality versus gauge invariance. So in the um, infinite universe context, we, we definitely know of a whole set of gauge invariant observables, um, which are the boundary correlators we talk about. Um, and the question that comes up in your context or even in the infinite context, when you want to talk about what's going on in the local region is, how can you define a gauge invariant observable associated with a local region? Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that's that's a, a key question. The formalism that Fischler and I invented it has you know a rather definite answer to that question, but it's it's a general question that I think needs to be addressed, and it's it's related to another really important question, and I don't know where to put that anywhere on the subtopics that are here, which is precisely how does quantum field theory emerge from the theory of quantum gravity? Mm -hmm. what, what is the mechanism, the mathematical mechanism by which quantum gravity gives rise to quantum field theory as an approximation? So I don't know where to put that, but I think it's somehow related to this. So, as a slogan, I would say local observables engage in there. And I guess, uh, well, sort of like between these two is the question of emergence of quantum field theory. Between those two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's 
time. <coughs> oh, maybe I'll put it on the line here. <laughs> QFT emergence, how about that? Well, maybe between or maybe not, right? It, well, it depends on what you think we will ultimately get out of holography. Right. It will, the current ideas about holography will precisely lead to a good approximation of local quantum field theory. Ted? Yes. So on a much more mundane uh, level, not trying to to solve all problems at once. Mm -hmm. The thing that might be measured if we're lucky in the next, say, half century or so is one-loop corrections to cosmological correlators. And for that, the issue right now is very, very unsatisfactory. There are three problems that we need to solve. They're all in old-fashioned perturbation theory. None of them have to do with doing things non-perturbatively or at all orders. In fact, the only thing that could possibly be measured would be the one-loop corrections. But right now, the three problems that we need to solve is, number one, come up with an observable that's infrared finite, two, uh, ultraviolet renormalizable in the sense of low energy effective field theory, and three, exhibits the existing pattern of epsilon suppression that, uh, uh, that naive corrections to the correlators uh, exhibit. Uh, but the naive corrections are, of course, uh, infrared divergent. So those three problems are the key problems. And right now, as far as I know, correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, nobody has a way of doing that, of solving all three problems at once. So by epsilon, you mean slow roll slow parameter? Slow roll parameter, that's right. So right now, the corrections to the naive correlator have the property that, uh, that miraculously, there are all kinds of cancellations that occur so that loop corrections exhibit a strange pattern of epsilon suppression. People know how to get rid of, but, but that thing is infrared sensitive, as I think Steve and Martin showed. People know how to uh, get rid of the infrared sensitivity by making non-local uh, invariant uh, extensions of the naive correlator, but those things have the property that we don't know how to renormalize them. They're non-local composite operators that we don't know how to renormalize, so we're trading the infrared sensitivity for uncontrollable ultraviolet behavior, number one. And number two, we've introduced new uh, things that are not epsilon suppressed. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's the correct result. But it seems kind of strange that the naive correlator would have such intricate uh, cancellations that caused loop corrections to be epsilon suppressed and that a purely arbitrary choice about how it is that we make a nonlinear extension to it is going to violate that and introduce non-epsilon suppressed things. And this makes a big difference as far as observability goes because epsilon, a factor of one over epsilon might be a hundred, over a hundred. Uh, so it makes, it makes a big, big difference as far as observability goes. And uh, right now, we don't have anything which will solve those three problems. And this is something where we don't have to ethereally solve everything at right. once. This is just one loop perturbation theory in the context of effective field theory. Has the issue of constructing the observables been approached perturbatively, just directly, order by yes. order? Yeah, sure. And so do we have, we don't even have a perturbative observable? Uh, well, we have a lot of people who've made proposals. None of them have all three of those properties. This and, is and something that kind of fits in both categories. You know, it's partly the infrared issues right. kind of discussion, and it's partly, you know, how do we formulate sensible observables with good IR properties so, and other and, and being renormalizable, because it doesn't do any good to solve the infrared problem if we lose control of the ultraviolet problem. Again, yeah. not, not in, in, the, in a non-perturbative sense, but just in the issue of low energy effective field theory, subtracting the divergences you know, with BPHC counterterms. Well, this is a discussion we have, but in some sense there's a hierarchy of problems, right? And maybe one should get the infrared structure uh, right. First, and then well, look okay. the one could do that. With a cut -off, so, so we should have more discussion. On so, that. so we could get the infrared structure, but then we lose control of the ultraviolet, and it's and they seem to be correlated. It seems to be that the very thing that that uh, 
that allowed you to control the infrared also introduces problems that screw up the ultraviolet. So you had something, a local correlator, that you knew how to renormalize in the BPHC sense. And when you make these non-local things, which will make it infrared finite, you then lose control of how to renormalize it. So it seems like you're trading one problem for another. Now, I'm not saying that that's a problem. I believe there probably is a way around it. Uh, and it's an eminently solvable problem because it's, it's something where we don't have to solve everything at once. We don't have to come up with a new theory of quantum gravity. We don't have to try and do everything to all orders. This is just one loop of things, and it might, in the fullness of time, be observable. Should we write that first and then move on? Yeah. So yeah. where do you want to place that in the primary category? And I'll put a cross link to <laughs> I would have said it's an issue of observables. OK, and your slogan? Uh, making perturbation theory uh, um, or defining perturbative observables. Right, in, uh, in slow roll inflationary context. You specifically mean, right, or no? Uh, yeah, uh, not in the slow roll approximation, but getting the existing, make, getting observables which preserve the existing pattern of epsilon suppression. Okay. See, again, we can we can make a new observable that will be infrared finite, but it'll disturb the existing pattern of epsilon suppression. Maybe that's right. If so, yeah. it's very important because it means that the results are very much more observable than otherwise. But uh, it kind of feels wrong. Why should nature work so hard to cause the naive correlators to be epsilon suppressed, and then when you define these new things, you suddenly lose that? Um, one more question about that. Do you know an example where you have good UV and IR behavior, but you lose only this uh, epsilon dependence? No, I don't even know how to get IR and UV together. Yeah, that's what I thought you were saying. And let's say, uh, I don't know how to put that. What is really the point you're making there? Loop corrections uh, to the naive correlators are epsilon suppressed. So the naive correlator, the scalar uh, power spectrum has a 1 over epsilon in it. That's the whole reason we think we can observe it and right. not the tensor power spectrum. The question is, do loop corrections have that? Right. Uh, the naive correlator loop corrections do not have that. There are power series in GH squared, not GH squared over epsilon. These corrections have the property that they make nonlinear extensions of the correlator. So you can, you can solve the infrared problem by making nonlinear extensions of the correlators, but then the nonlinear extensions of the correlators are like introducing new interactions, and those new interactions are not epsilon suppressed. Maybe that's right. If it is, it's very important because it means they're much more observable by a factor of over 100. But it just seems wrong. It seems like it's just crazy. You're making an arbitrary definition of how you make the nonlinear extension of the observable, and, and, it, and it violates the pattern of the, this intricate pattern of things the way diagrams combine. In any case, I propose that as something that, that needs to be resolved and something that's imminently resolvable because it, it's not everything all at once. It's just right. a one loop order. Just one comment about, isn't epsilon suppression ultimately is a, sort of a statement of de Sitter invariance, something like that? So that like if there's a completely stationary de Sitter invariant interacting vacuum, then, then you somehow have a perfectly good IR and UV behavior of that vacuum in de Sitter space. And so somehow the, the lack of the epsilon suppression that, that you're, if you see it, is somehow could be traced back to the statement that um, that whatever you're doing is inconsistent with having a de Sitter invariant vacuum. Would you agree with that? I, I wouldn't disagree with it. I don't know whether it's true or not. Okay, okay so Jim. Um, is the large scale geometry of the universe an observable? <laughs> if yes, how is it represented in the theory? And if not, how come we observe it? 
Okay, let's make that shorter, but that's good. Uh, let's write down large scale geometry, yes or no? Okay. <laughs> What is your definition of large scale? The, the largest scale of the seeds? So basically, are you, you're just talking about very coarse grained yeah. geometry observers. I understand that the question could be elaborated. Yeah. Okay. Do you know the answer, by the way? Or? <laughs> of course I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, folks, time is too short here. <laughs> I assume when you ask this question, you're not talking about the large scale geometry of the so called multiverse. But only of what we actually see in the sky. Uh, you're right, but then why not? Right? Talk about the large scale geometry. Of the yeah, but that's two separate questions, right? Yeah, but then multiverse is the next thing. <laughs> How can we observe a multiverse? What's observable? Nice uh, <laughs> again. Is the multiverse observable? Sounds yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Is there anyone in the room that claims to have actually calculated satisfactorily a one loop correction to cosmological correlators? Leonardo had to go to traffic school, but I think he was. <laughs> <laughs> therefore, therefore, you might doubt his result. But he was. <laughs> He's violating his own speech. <laughs> It was <laughs> <laughs> Ted, what do you mean by calculate? Because I, I don't think anybody could do the calculation in a general geometry because we don't even have the propagators. Yeah. Well, at, at, well, the right thing, right. at least we calculated, I mean, the observable effect, right? I mean, uh, which will depend on, uh, I mean, yeah, okay, so where the. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, okay, so basically what we call... One sec, so the answer is yes? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. So yeah. then this will be some grist for the mill on the Friday discussion, probably. I don't think we should try to discuss it in detail yet. But I just wanted to know as a counterpoint to Richard's interesting, uh, the problem that he posed, I just wanted to know if anybody in the room says they know how to do it, basically. But, Again, but, I think Leonardo will say that, but we should wait well, for Well, let, let's be clear. You mean an exact calculation with all yeah. the I's dotted and all the T's done so that the result is just a number or some function of the fixed external parameters? No, okay, so basically the result is, uh, it depends on, on, the, on some kind of um, IR, IR cutter, which, which is basically the, the observable size of the universe. Um, and that acts as a kind of, you know, infrared renormalization uh, of, of your observable. Okay. So if you in the future have access to more parts of the universe, I mean, if you live for a long time in more scales into the horizon, then your infrared cutoff, of course, is larger. And then you have like, an, you can actually write maybe down a renormalization, infrared renormalization group for your observables, so that you see how the observable scales with infrared cutoff, which is your observable one. And I think we, we wrote down an equation like that. So, yeah, it's analogous to the story of soft photons in uh, gauge theory, where, of course, you introduce a resolution parameter and do inclusive uh, calculations. And you know, once you do that, uh, you, know, you have a, well, some level of sensitivity to that parameter, but everything's nice and fine. So you're getting the result to leading order in the infrared cutoff, is that correct? But, but not the full result. Because see, I would well, say the infrared normalization scale. I think we can see how it goes, but I think there's more to do. Is the short uh, answer? I, I would say we don't even have the mode functions exactly, or the propagators exactly, right? Okay. So this is useful. It, it, it will be good to have more discussion about what needs to be done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also uh, about the 
the coupling between infrared UV. So Richard mentioned that it's uh, it's hard to it, you know decouple these two you know different effects. That uh, we've done that uh, we've tried to discuss about that, and uh, we show that to some extent we can disentangle the UV. Uh, renormalization program from the infrared uh, regularity program. And uh, we also identify that what kind of countertimes are necessary. And, uh, yeah. So you can renormalize your observable? So it's a uh, defined BPHC program sense. where we can introduce a countertime which we can, uh, you know, which uh, can re remove that kind of the UV poles. But we also, we discuss that what kind of the countertimes are necessary and that still stays uh, local. So I think that uh, there could be some way to disentangle these two different programs. Well, you're saying more than that. You're saying you've done it. No, no we just, uh, uh, maybe we can just postpone the detailed discussion to later. Yeah, again. Uh, this sounds very, uh, it'll be very sure stimulating. It, and also I agree with you, Richard, that it sounds like something actually <laughs> resolvable, which is a good thing to have something like that. Uh, maybe we should. Is there anything else about squarely in the observables category, or should we move on? Cliff, you're about to say something. Okay. Did I have anything else? No. Okay. Uh, well, okay. How about uh, under holography? I have a question. I'm not sure I understood this discussion very well, but were we talking about gravity, like one of the corrections in gravity, or, or the theory of a massive scalar field, or a massive scalar field? What, what was the context for this? It's including graviton. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, depending on the, so if we include gravity, or if we do, do not include gravity, so that the, the problem looks uh, different. But yeah, there, in both cases, uh, there are the inference. Well, the fundamental theory would be Einstein plus uh, scalar with potential term, minimally coupled scalar with potential term. Okay. And uh, one loop just means one loop. Uh, and the thing that one's trying to calculate is uh, two-point correlators of the fields. Uh, and then uh, I guess Yuko is saying that she has a way of defining, uh, she and Takahiro, I suppose, are saying that they have a way of defining uh, Nonlinear extensions of what they mean by these uh, two-point correlators, such that, uh, that they claim they can renormalize it, and uh, Martin and uh, Steve are claiming something similar. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure about the renormalization statement, but, but that's that's how I, how I interpret those two statements. Okay, so uh, under holography and how to decode the hologram. Um, or people are so put up other topics too. True. Or true, but it might as well. Headings. You know, yeah, feel free to say whatever you want. Um, contribute if, if this is a good time to take about five minutes. Why not? Okay, so it comes from a paper by, actually I need to draw a picture. So it, sure. It comes from a paper <laughs> last Tuesday by Kasowski, Yoshida, So this is a puzzle from a paper last Tuesday by Pastowski, Yoshida, Harlow, and Preskill. And it's pertinent to a number of things people think about. So it's the following puzzle. Let's, let, me, let me draw. How about putting it good, good. we can keep our. Good, good. Let me draw, I was gonna, uh, let me draw the uh, CFT uh, there. And let me consider two regions in the CFT. Well, one region which is disconnected. One region which is disconnected. So there's A which has two pieces. And each piece of A is larger than a quarter. So the sum is larger than a half. And then the question, so this is the CFT, and the question is, can you, by measuring, by measurements within A, by measure, by, if you know the density matrix uh, in A, 
do you Are know? You in vacuum? You're in vacuum. Uh, so no, you, there, there's some. Well, for, uh, the, for the for the purpose of drawing the picture, I'm assuming that I'm close to a semi-classical ADS space. Um, uh, close to a semi-classical ADS space. Um, so yeah, let's suppose we're close. Let's suppose, let, I want to draw. I'm, I'm about to draw a causal wedge and an entanglement wedge. So let's suppose we're close enough to ADS that like we know what we mean by those. But the question is, if can I, by measurements in these two regions, know whether there are excitations in the center of the space? So now let me draw the boundary of the causal wedge. So this is okay, and this is this is all in a space-like slice. I'll, I'm actually going to draw one more picture, which is the time development, and let me draw the boundary of the entanglement wedge, which is larger. I think it was your paper who named these things, right? And and so the question, and so the the point, the, the the region that we're talking about is within the entanglement wedge, but not within the causal wedges. And your question is what? Whether by measure, whether by measuring the CFT state uh, in in the region A, measuring the full density matrix there, measuring any measurement you want, can you detect that excitation? And that means distinguish it from the vacuum, or it means determine the excitation uniquely? It does say determine it uniquely. Okay. Yeah. And this is a question at finite n or infinite n? Good. Good. So. Um, well, good. So, so I'm going to make an assertion about what's possible to all orders in the one over n expansion. And if you want to say something about finite n, that's interesting. But let me let me suppose we're working as usual in gravity in the one over n expansion. So, so your puzzle that you're phrasing is in the context of the one over n expansion. Right. That's right. That's right. So in particular, in particular, if the excitation were within the causal wedge, we could do it to leading order in one over n. That is, there. Right. So if the excitation were in the causal wedge, we know we could we have precursor operators, whatever we can measure detect this to leading order one over n. So um, this paper is is giving this error correcting interpretation of the decoding, and in particular, it's standard error correction that you, there are error correcting codes such that if you have more than half of the bits, you can read whatever message is encoded in the full set. And, and so in this paper, they have a nice tensor error correcting code. And because they have more than half of the bits, uh, they, can, they, they can read the message. They can read the message. They can, they can determine the state. But the claim is they can determine the state everywhere, even outside the entanglement wedge, because they have more than half the bits? Um, no, I think no, no, only within the entanglement wedge. Okay. That's if they exactly can localize. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. Now, now, um, now, I think this is also so. I think there's also a sense in the entanglement entry community that this is that this should be true. I'm not sure that it's it's a conjecture. I think it counts as a conjecture, though. Yes. <laughs> and I think that the opposite is true. That is that you can only detect within the causal wedges. And the argument is the following. Let me now rotate this so we have we 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 have time. I'm sorry. Just to be clear. Yes. This error correcting code that was written in this paper is something written in the context of a one over n expansion. This error correcting code, meh. It's 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 a code. It's not it's it's, an, it's not really written in any context. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't have n. They don't have n. I mean, it's an exact pro it's, it's an exact property of the code. It's a five qubit system. It's, 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 it's a toy model, model. Uh, yeah. where the bulk is represented by this tensor network. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, maybe this is cutting you off, but I'm curious if there's you know, a, a tension between your point of view and theirs at all, if, if really in a large in sense, if you took their code and did a one over expansion, whether it still has the properties they want. No, I think it I, I, Well, they don't have, they don't think n is a relevant parameter, so I mean, that's, but that's, so, so um, let, me, let me draw this picture now in space time. So there's our, there's our, um, um, you know, patches of A. And then each has a, um, a um, domain of dependence that is the full part of the CFT, which is determined by the state on A. And notice that our operator is, is space-like separated from the entire domain of dependence on both sides. And so by bulk locality, you would expect that it would commute with all local operators in the domain of dependence. 
which is a sufficiently strong statement that it should act that one expects it should act as the identity within the on, on the Hilbert space A. Now let me let me let me finish my statement before you explain where I'm wrong. Um, and, 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 and therefore, since the, the okay, so I'm talking about set what acts the pre, the precursor, the operator that creates this particle in the center of the bulk. I I'm saying that this acts as, as the identity here. If it acts as the identity here, it's undetectable, obviously. You cannot, even if you know the full density matrix, know whether that operator has acted. So maybe there's a flaw in the argument I've just made, which would be very interesting. Uh, but this is, a, this is a puzzle which is a week old, and I think it obviously cuts across what many people are thinking. Yeah. So I yield the floor. So yeah. can we just, before we continue, let's put a slogan for this. Is it like, you know, the role of bulk causality, or oh, well, maybe you could, we, we could say causal. Well, I mean, well, there's lots of slogans. One is causal wedge or entanglement wedge. Yeah, I mean that's 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 a smaller part of a lot, maybe a larger debate about the role of gauge invariance and error correction. But this, but this is, I, I say, this is very, so, so, so there's kind of a debate going back and forth between um, their group and ours. And, and, but they, they, well, they, they didn't print it as a puzzle. They, they, they took it for granted that you could see the whole entanglement wedge. But I interpreted they've made a very sharp puzzle, uh, which is exactly in this area of, of how, how Could it, you just explain where the entanglement wedge is on your space-time diagram? On the space-time diagram here, it would, um, it would, it would be. Well, I, I don't actually know how to how to draw it off of the Cauchy surface. surface. You can draw the equal zero slice. This this is the T zero. And it's the shape. I have exhausted my ability to draw geometry. <laughs> so I. I <laughs> Subregions we get from the uh, boundary theory and so on. Uh, so I think the way to draw the lines to you might be: a, is there another slogan that can emerge from whatever it was you were about to say? Good. That's a yeah. Otherwise, it, otherwise it will be a great thing to dig into during the yeah. We'll start to really get into like that discussion more next time. Yes. Yeah, I have a slogan that delves to sort of this this issue, which is. What part of the reduced density matrix, rho A, uh, is, contains the bulk geometry? Part of. Where is, where is the bulk geometry in the reduced density matrix? If you capture the information given in the reduced density matrix, how much of that information. What is the dual of the data? In a sense, but I want to single out what part of the information content in the reduced density matrix is the one that pertains to the geometry. Right, so how about the question? Bulk geometry? I think the question is what CFT observables encode the bulk geometry? 
No, that, well, that that's a separate question. Oh, that's a separate question. question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, asking specifically in the reducing. In A, yes. yes. Reduce. What, what's the empty observables in A and codes of all geometry? In the that's a separate question, yeah. But uh, no, no, what's your question? I think it's the it's, same question. If you, if you, you just say, if you've got a density matrix, you can measure the expectation values of some set of observables, and that's all the information there is in that density matrix. Right? And, and the question is, can you identify some particular operators? I mean, I, 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 think the, I think Veronica, I, I'm with Veronica on this, because entanglement entropy is an observable. That's, sure. You can directly compute from the, the density matrix. Uh, well, okay, it's, it's a quantity that you can calculate, but yeah. it's not a direct observable. Slogans only now. <laughs> Are you satisfied with that? Okay, let's do this. <laughs> okay. Um, but isn't there another question behind this, namely, to what extent is there a valid geometry? I think the argument... As a well-defined, precise... Uh, I think right. Joe would tell you, or Don, that at large end there is definitely a bulk geometry. Right? Yeah. yeah. We believe that. Depends on the state. What? That depends on the state. A large, yeah, large end yeah, yeah. with large end near the vacuum state. Oh, near yeah. the vacuum state. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sure. You want to ask it more generally? Yeah. How precise is the, how resolved is bulk geometry? Resolve implies it's there, but not detected yet. You're really asking is how well defined oh, is it? Yeah, how precise. Mm -hmm. Another version of that is to, you know, that's touching on these, is to ask uh, what bulk observables do we have access to? And, you know, that connects with the previous theme. Uh, but, uh, you know, how do we reconstruct, uh, in the boundary theory, things that behave like good bulk observables? And, you know, there are certainly proposals along those lines, uh, which... One sec, could you just say any observable in the boundary? Uh, no, I don't care about observables in the boundary that are just relevant to the structure of the boundary, roughly speaking. I care about things that will tell me something about the bulk. So, something you know how to recognize. Yeah, something I can that you know reflects uh, the expected structure of the of the bulk theory. You know, tells us something about the space time of the bulk. For example, I could write down the expectation value of some tiny Wilson loop on the boundary, and well, I, you know, maybe that does ultimately tell me something about the bulk, but a priori it's just a statement about, uh, or it's just probing the, the boundary dynamics. So, you know, we'd like to identify the things that are useful for describing uh, bulk physics and matching on to uh, sort of what we expect from bulk physics, say, approximating local quantum field theory in the bulk. Right. So, so one is identification of observables, and also in the theme of uh, matching on to things we'd like to recognize in the book, there's the question of uh, how do we extract the uh, flat space S matrix in the large radius limit, the ADS. And so there's been various discussion on that uh, and proposals, but that's another way we could go after this question of decoding the hologram is uh, really cleanly seeing how that works. You 
You said flat, but you really mean um, perturbative, right? Or something? Well, I do mean, no, I don't, not perturbative, because ultimately we'd like to ask it interesting questions like, you know, what happens when you form a black hole and it evaporates? That's a non perturbative right. question. Right. Have a, a so bulk flat. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, really. You know, in the flat limit, let's say the ADS radius oh, you is. Want to go to the flat limit. Yeah, let's Sorry. say the ADS radius is you know ten to the ten light years or something. Why is that important to um, specify that you're taking that limit? Because you'd like to uh, match on to the usual structure of local quantum field theory and see it uh, in regimes where the curvature is basically small, or at least the background curvature is small. Can I ask a naive question just to clarify your question? Suppose I just took a fixed uh, a quantum field theory in anti de Sitter background, so no gravity, and I just want to, but it's an interacting quantum field theory. Yeah. Is there a well defined S matrix? Um, that's actually. It just yeah. generalizes the black space one. Yeah, that's actually, there's some tricky points there, and that's also a valid question, I think. There are things, there are boundary correlators you can define, but what is their relationship to something we really call an S matrix? I mean, it would seem like that's the thing, whatever it is that you should go after. But we'll, we'll have more of this discussion next week. But again, uh, you know, if the radius of ADS were 10 to the 10 light years, and you know, that were used to define quantum gravity in the book, uh, then you might say that, uh, okay, we should be able to describe uh, sort of scattering on much shorter scale, say at the LHC, and uh, predict the outcome of that in, you know, in the theory from the, from the boundary theory, because that's supposed to be defining the theory. Well, I see what you're getting at. You really want to, yeah, to get the flat spaces. Okay. Yeah. Or at least in the in the large R limit. It doesn't have to be the exactly R equals infinity. But at least large R. Okay. Yes. There's a bit more general version of the question of <clears throat> sort of how universal is the emergence of space-time in holography to emergence of space-time in you know say our our world or any any theory of quantum zero of gravity. Are the lessons that we're learning from the holographic context, can we then safely assume that uh, those will be the same lessons, you know, say black hole information and resolution paradox, those will be the same lessons uh, for, you know, black holes in with any asymptote, yeah. which many of us probably assume that is true, but it might be useful to ask, you know, how much does the global nature in holography influence the lo lo physics at the lo local scales. So, so something I, I'd like to clarify about what you just said, because I, I think you are using the term holography as interchangeable with ADS-CFT when yes. you ask that question. Yes. Okay, and I, oh, the, the term actually predates ADS-CFT. I certainly <laughs> think of it in a much more general way. But I, I think your question is really a good one, namely how much of what we learn from ADS-CFT is actually useful to tell us about local physics. Very good. So I, I agree. That's an important distinction. So we think that any theory of gravity is holographic. Should that go under here, or is it in a different category? Well, it's sort of a meta question for holography. But yeah, I think it goes right under the holography. <clears throat> so your slogan is? Universality of emergence of space time. something to add to, to that in combination with what you asked before, Ted, about closed universes. So the, this is, again, a, a well-known question, but what is the significance of the decay of the sitter space uh, to a, you know, asymptotically decelerating FRW solution? Um, 
it has all sorts of interesting properties, like the entropy bound goes off to infinity in contrast to the finite entropy of the dis, you know, given talking entropy of, of the consider phase. And you know how important is that in, in the more general holographic dualities? So you mean, like, can we still do DSCFT kind of ignoring Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more politely example. asking whether DSCFT makes sense. Oh, now we have the slogan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can put Eva's name next to it. <laughs> put the, just the role of the decay of the center space, if you don't mind. Okay, under, <laughs> under holography. I mean, I have an opinion about this, but there's no, no need to. Go on. Maybe in parenthesis, you, you might say, must consider space always decay? Because that's something that. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Must it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can put that. Oh, you can put it underneath. Yeah, put it underneath. Good. Yeah. yeah. Or you think it's I, I, I was yeah, I that's, that's put it in parenthesis on Doritos' question. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the spirit yeah. of the Must question. It. Is, is, it, is <laughs> so. it decaying in, say, in string theory, is it decaying for a reason? Is it not going to happen that way? And I, I think it fits well with many other things, but that's a, it's a fine question. Wow. Well, related to that point, so the, if DSCFT is possible, what is? time in holographic setup. Time and RG flow, let's say. Yeah. Yes. Uh, under log, what's the principle for establishing the bulk bound detection? The principle? Yeah. Uh, how are we? So once we have ADS-CFT, how are we supposed to know how to map bulk quantities to boundary quantities? Because the way we do it now is we just compare bulk observables near the boundary with boundary observables. Uh, and then everything else is sort of circular reasoning. We just use bulk equations of motion. Um, but there we're not using the CFT. We're just using bulk equations of motion. And then there are these exceptional things like Ryo Takenagi, which is sort of mysterious why it works. Um, so there needs to be some principle to know what the dictionary is. That's, that's, that's kind of coming back to the question of identifying uh, operators that correspond to useful bulk observables in the boundary theory. Right? No, I just mean, or, no, or I just mean how to establish the dictionary. Like, um, I think that's a good part of the dictionary. Isn't it? For in a way, that's sort of like that's the title of the whole. Are you saying something? No, it's specific? conceivable that when ADS-CFT was discovered. We would have known much more of the dictionary from the way it was derived by Malthus. Derived by Malthus and, um. so you're saying there's a need for some. Uh, with the, at the moment, there's sort of like guesswork and exactly. And, um, and there's a need for some. It's, true. it's either using bulk equations of motion or guessing. So, bulk, using bulk equations of okay. motion is how, how we get precursors. Is there a principle of yeah, bulk yeah. construction? Yeah. Uh, principle for establishing the dictionary. Um, Are you assuming here that there's like something more than just using the the boundary dictionary? Like, I'm assuming. What I'm just asking is, in '98, 
why didn't someone tell us Rio Takianagi or other things to be discovered later? Why did it take so long and so much guessing and then checking? Yeah, because we miss, we don't have a recipe. We don't exactly. have to hold it because we're just making stuff up. Uh, well, I, think, I, think, I think a related question is what does it take to get a large radius dual? I mean, that, that question remains interesting. On the CFT side, what are, I mean, what are yeah, the yeah, properties that are necessary? Right, just if I give you a, a field theory with a certain you know, field content, does it or does it not generate a large radius dual? Most of the time it will not. So what does it take? I want to start a new column. <laughs> we could, uh, if there are any more on that, we'll move. <laughs> yeah. 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 I guess there are two subsets for that question. Yeah. Okay. So, what, I mean, both what CFTs have that property and what states in the okay. emerging set of CFTs mm -hmm. have that property. Didn't Rio Takenagi end up not, I mean, being part of the original dictionary, plus just the bulk? I mean, that that ended up being what Rio Takenagi was. For spheres. That's what you mean? For spheres, the duals that have a bulk black hole in them. I mean, they're the way it's all the same. Yeah, just yeah, for sphere. Right. Look at how it's in that they did the replica trick and the bulk on the boundary. Right, so but, but, but the, 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 the piece of the dictionary they used was the old piece. I mean, the, 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 this was known forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if there's something I'm missing about the, this 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 element of the dictionary that we've learned like recently that that, that I didn't know that, that, that isn't just related to the standard KPW dictionary. Yeah, HRT, HRT, the the, the, the time, time dependent. Uh, yeah, let's say that one. That, that's no one's derived. Uh, All right, so I want to make you stand up very tall right at the very top there. Um, <laughs> is there an independent, non perturbative construction of the bulk? Yeah. Let me yeah, they reorganize this slightly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see. <laughs> well, we're not going to forget it. <laughs> you can erase this. Steve, can I do this? Is there an independent, non perturbative? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You mean independent of CFT? Independent of CFT. Like, can you just do quantum gravity? Is there, does quantum gravity exist in the bulk in the bulk language? Yes. Okay. Does a UV completion of quantum gravity exist in the bulk? In right. Yeah. Exactly. The Rogers bulk from the boundary. No, no. Just does does it? Oh. Is, is there a is there a construction of the bulk that doesn't that doesn't use the boundaries. But we've never heard of ADS oh, CFT to be cross quantum gravity. To, to explain maybe more what this no, means, if the perturbation series in type 2B string theory yeah. was Borel summable, then we would have a, such a construction. But that, so that we definitely have a bulk definition well, of the... Uh, I guess that would be uh, an example, right? That would be, right, right. right. Yeah, but we, we know there's... Hopefully it's there's probably We know right. it's not. This right. actually and reminds me Maybe there's the, some analytic consideration that gets though. around that. That is, because in most dualities we have independent construction of the two sides, and then, right. then they're the same thing that we construct. Right. Does this resurgent stuff add anything to those kinds of questions? Um, nobody okay. has looked at whether those, those tricks would apply to string theory. I don't know that we know enough about the string theory. Well, in, in gravity, the perturbation series isn't even asymptotic. It's worse. So it, we can actually that gets on the mm -hmm. through scattering. <laughs> so so to to for certain fixed energy quantities. Um, at high energies, it's not even as. I didn't say you high energy. It's something. But you need all. Quantities. You need it for all energies if you want the whole S maker to say. Okay. Valid point. <clears throat> in the la in the uh, three years ago, I guess or so, bits, brains, and black holes program. One issue that was discussed, partly because I insisted on it, was whether or not, um, what of which was, what about monsters? Monsters, you remember, were the fact that if you just, this is related to Joe's question, I think, if you just take gravity plus in the bulk and you start to say, I'm going to quantize it and look at its classical phase space, 
and then start to proceed to quantization and UV completion, well, vice versa maybe, but anyway, you immediately have a puzzle, I think, because the classical phase space includes these monsters, which seem to not be in the CFT. So if you could succeed, it would be a different theory, I think. Um, you have to define what monsters means. I'm monsters are uh, classical solutions that have uh, more entropy at fixed energy than the CFT can have. Cornucopions. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, cornucopions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, 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 a bag of gold. The, 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 bag, the, of gold the bag of gold solutions. Okay. Right. And they are things that when you classically evolve them, you'll find out that all that entropy was behind a horizon. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they're in that phase space if you start to quantize them. Yep. Oh, and you said they're not in the CFT. Right. Well, people convince me that. Yeah, they don't have there's enough. There's not enough. There's space nothing in the CFT. with enough entropy to account for. I think I'll take the liberty to write what about They can't all be in the CFT as independent states, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, why don't you say AKA bags of gold? Because that's historically the first name for these things. And okay, why there is a reason, which is that the bag of gold actually does have a minimal surface. And the point of the, the monster was to actually do it without even having a minimal surface anywhere. I see. Okay. But we could say or bags of gold. All right, look, maybe we should, um, because we don't want to stay here forever this afternoon, see what we have to say about the other things on the board. This has been fantastic. Okay, let's see. So anybody can start. Well, we might think about how to structure this. I, I want to come to this. But uh, say on holography, you know, next week we'll kick off a lot of that because we're going to have the focus week. Right. But then after that, we might want to start with uh, a working group or two on some subset of these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe the way to handle that is to sort of see what develops out of next week for the on the holography subject because that's coming up. So I have something that I think should go under IR questions and issues, which is um, <coughs> I, I guess I would call it the role of zero energy states in scattering. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm referring in particular to the papers that Andy Strominger has written recently about uh, the BMS group and so on, and the, the, the real importance of states that you can't quite think of as particles in that context. Good. Scattering. If there's a role in scattering, you think it's only in scattering? No, no. But you know, it's relevant cosmology too. But they don't. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Should leave it this way. That's fine. Or at least they're close analogs in cosmology and hold the sitter story. Question that probably nobody wants to hear. Boltzmann rates. No. <laughs> what about Boltzmann rates? Does probability make sense in quantum cosmology? Same question. It was just pointed out. So 
Sorry, Ted. It was just pointed out it, we have a room limitation. We have 15 more minutes. Uh -huh. I didn't realize that, but Veronica pointed that out. Thank you. Okay. Well, probably the intense interest in this category does mean that people will have more to say about that than these. Please, uh, you haven't gotten there yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is open. You can, yeah. Black hole info is, yes. Okay, so I'll put another infrared issue, and yeah. that is uh, what's the late time limit of uh, quantum gravity uh, in consider background? Or does it have to decay? <laughs> <laughs> That's related to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Sorry. Right. What is uh, the fate? Is that the same as what is the fate of the sitter space? Uh, I think so, but I, I would not link it necessarily to holography. I would say that that's an issue, uh, an infrared issue that ought to be analyzable just in terms of low energy effect. All right, we can repeat the question. Sure. But I would add in quantum gravity because... Uh, right. You just had a scalar, for example, I'm not sure. I, I have one other uh, sort of issue for infrared things, and that is, should uh, we see effects, uh, should there be a broadening effect of particles trying to propagate through uh, inflationary gravitons? Oh, that yeah. is, suppose you tried to propagate a photon through uh, the sitter. Should you see it get scattered by the gravitons that are being produced by the sitter? Same question for fermions, same question for any particle. So, um, Sorry, isn't that how we see the... Let's see what the so slow well, there are many people in this room uh, who would argue that there isn't such an effect and that there can't be such an effect, and they would say so vehemently. Um, you're preaching to the choir as far as I go, but uh, the opinion does exist that there is no such effect. Sorry, the CMB photons, the standard story is that they are sensitive. Uh, again, I, I agree totally with you, but there are quite a number of people in this room who would disagree vehemently. Why is it I'm not hearing you. I'm trying to do that, but uh, so do you want, you're asking, do they scatter from vacuum fluctuations, specifically in de Sitter space? Or? That is, that's right. So oh. suppose that you try and propagate a photon through de Sitter. Should you see? Uh, you want a you want a buzzword, uh, and that is uh, to. Uh, um, Perturbative loop corrections change the kinetic uh, properties of uh, photons. Say. What's it? Does does vacuum polarization change the kinetic properties of photons, or does vacuum polarization change photon kinetics? The answer in flat space would be no. Photon kinematics. And you, you mean in the sitter space? In the sitter, on the sitter background. Sure, the sitter. Well, uh, Einstein plus Maxwell. Well, I'm aware of arguments that there are some. Uh, growing secular effect in time, if that's what you're referring to, I'll be willing to say no. But well, that will be given, given our time constraint, I think yeah. we should just put the question down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, an obvious question is, um, I mean, I think it's, you, the most boring assumption is that this iterative has to decay in, in string theory, and so then we're talking about something like eternal inflation. And, and we really have no idea. I mean, we have some idea of what DSCFT might be, but we have really no idea of what, what is the 
write description of eternal inflation or pretty much any cosmological space time in, in string theory. I guess that's here a little bit with something about the closed universe. But, you know, the, it seems likely that the future asymptotics of our universe are eternal inflation. And, um, How do you make sense of that as a quantum theory? Is that yeah. Your, yeah. 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 Which yeah, <coughs> assumes it, you know things like measures, Boltzmann brains, etc. Right. So, yeah. It also raises a particular technical question that ties the two together. Whose slogan might be inflating holograms? Question mark could mean many things, but you know, it's yeah. a long-standing <laughs> question been discussed for a long time about is it really true that you can get an inflating region that is described by is described within the ADS CFT context by the dual gauge theory. I mean, it ties into many of these questions. That's it. Yeah, ADS is one question, but it's not obvious that there's any ADS asymptotics no, 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 in no, our no, universe. No. So I'd also like to ask yep. about these other asymptotics. Uh, yep. <coughs> so you want to ask, does eternal inflation make sense? Or what's the quantum theory? Is there a quantum theory of eternal inflation? That's good. Yeah. yeah. So before we run out of time, I wonder about black holes. Yeah, it would be a shame not to. No one, no one cares about firewalls or anything anymore. <laughs> so. Well, you know, to a large extent, you can repeat many of these questions and just put arrows over the black hole information. Yeah, but there, there are other ones too. You know, how do we describe unitary evolution of a black hole? Does it mean that you burn up at the horizon? A question you, uh, <laughs> well, you, you think you know the answer. But, uh, so. uh, I'd like to put the Merle wall on there. This is just something that's been bothering me lately. Well, it's been bothering me for a while, but it's been bothering me a lot. The people or the painter? It's <laughs> <laughs> a long time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> could you put, could you write moral wall on there? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean Merrill wall or Merrill wall? W-A-L-L. -L. Aaron wall. <laughs> and what is this referring to? They, they wrote a paper that I don't understand. Well, I understand the paper, I don't understand. That's a super selection paper. Yeah. ER is not equal to EPR, that's what the paper was about. Yeah, and, and, and maybe selection you should say Merrill and a period wall. So we were. But wait, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not fire. It's not useful. Let's can you phrase it in a way that's. There are people in this room who will vehemently disagree with you if you don't write Merrill slash wall. <laughs> 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 I would just like to discuss the, the Merrill wall. Yeah, yeah, there are things that are not, not everything is a question, right? The, the question in a descriptive sense is, I mean, <laughs> is, there a un, is there a unique holographic dictionary? How about that? Is there a unique bulk boundary correspondence in the context of gauge gravity duality? Does that make everybody happy? It's related to... ER does not equal EPR, question mark. We can phrase things that way as well. Um, but these are slogans you can write down. What about Marl slash wall, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit better. <laughs> John Douglas is worked up here. All right, I'll just do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been in here too long. <laughs> Stanford question mark, too. <laughs> So what do we do with mm -hmm. chaos? The role of mm -hmm. chaos in the black hole horizon geometry. We've learned a lot. I mean, it's really, I think it's a really interesting question. 
Rope chaos is diagnostic or? Rope? It's a diagnostic of the existence of horizon. Right? <coughs> How so. about just the leading effect that, break, that causes a breakdown of effective field theory in a UV complete theory? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so about just calculating that. Why? Actually, leading, I mean, leading break, leading. Uh, how, how, if you want. Oh. See, I, don't, I think it, it doesn't necessarily. <laughs> so I want to say it does. But we'll you put your question mark. You could say it certainly what, does. what affects unit to rise. No, 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 no. I, this is not what I mean. I mean, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, is what is the leading uh, cause of the breakdown of effective field theory for the late black hole? then add to that what affects unitarized uh, evolution since that's not the same. Claimed not to be the same. <coughs> but it, it, well, this is, this is. We are, uh, <clears throat> how can the CFT describe the black hole interior? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while this partially restates earlier questions, I think it might be able to add to that. And how much does it describe? <laughs> um, maybe adding to Eva's question, uh, signs of breakdown, like probes. Um, so, okay, unitarizing with the entropy is one kind of probe. In string theory, we have other kinds of probes that probe breakdown of many geometries. A list of sort of probes that could tell you break down maybe more local probes. And, um, Under here? Yeah. About diagnostics? Just just accurate, accurate computations of this. That's what we're asking. Pardon? We're just, yeah. I mean, just calculations. <laughs> actually, check, actually checking. That's the question. Well, see, the problem is, I mean, just to say one comment, EFT, there's an F in there. So, I mean, F refers to local field theory, but... This links back to the issue that, you know, this is quantum gravity. So we first have to understand how does, you know, it's a bigger problem. What are local observables yeah, yeah, in quantum this gravity is more down before to you can address this? This is a more down to earth question. It's what is the leading cause of effective field theory breakdown, let's say, in perturbative string theory? Right. Uh, the question is when do you, when are you able to stop using field theory? And, and, and quantum gravity becomes important. Yeah, and what tells you that? Okay. But we're using the tools of, even just perturbative string theory, this question has, has not been carefully answered. Okay. And it's it's an eminently answerable question. So that's what that's where this is coming from. <coughs> does that actually also fit under scattering? Yeah, Excuse actually me. it does. It's related. So um <coughs> I think in scattering we sort of know what the leading cause of the breakdown of effective field theory is. It's the formation of black holes, right? It depends what regime so, you're in and what you mean by the question. Oh, you're talking about string theory context yeah, where you yeah, break down. Yeah. Yeah. So just no, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I do. <coughs> In string theory or not, I think you know, it really Yeah, whatever UV conclusion you want to consider. Um, well, yeah, but, uh, then you start to lose the concreteness of your question. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I totally agree. I think there is a fair amount of concreteness in the. Oh, yeah, we should. Uh, 
All right, I think we've just run out of time. Can somebody take a picture? Yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah, I want to do one. Thank you very much, everybody, for a really terrific. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was good.